Thank you once again for joining us for this, our seventh installment of the Caribbean Pathology and Laboratory Medicine Students Initiative, or CIPAMS session. As mentioned previously, we would like you to record your presence on the attendance register, so please click on the link in the chat and fill out the form. Noting that students from Mona, Cavill, and St. Augustine campuses are required to fill out separate attendance registers. So as such, please fill out the respective forms that correspond to your campus. Also, we would like to, ensure, to inform you that this session is being recorded for storage and archives. Therefore, to ensure the integrity of our production, we kindly ask for your audio and video functions to be turned off. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I introduce our president, Ms. Anne-Marie Min Hong. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a special warm welcome to our colleagues from the Mona and Cavill campuses, as well as our specially invited guests. I acknowledge our advisory board member, Dr. Alfredo Walker, and staff and students of the University of Ottawa and Eastern Ontario Regional Laboratory Association. Thank you for joining us for the seventh installment of our Caribbean Pathology and Laboratory Medicine Student Initiative. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, I am tasked yet privileged to be introducing our featured speaker this afternoon, Dr. John Wolf. He will be sharing his wealth of experience and passion for, pathology, for neuropathology in a 60 minute overview. Dr. John Wolf is currently attending staff neuropathologist in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine of the Ottawa Hospital, Associate Professor in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, University of Ottawa, and is an associate scientist at the Ottawa Health Research Institute. Dr. Wolf completed his PhD in neurology and neurosurgery at McGill University in 1991, his MD at McMaster University in 1994, and specialty, sorry, excuse, and specialty training in clinical neuropathology from the University of Western Ontario in 1998. Dr. Wolf's research is focused on the pathogenesis of neurodegenerative disorders. Over the past few years, he is focused on exploring a possible relationship between the host immune response to Epstein-Barr virus and the development of Parkinson's disease. As part of this ongoing project, he is investigating the distribution of alpha synuclein in the gut and other immune organs, as well as blood-brain blood virus function in Parkinson's disease. Without a doubt, Dr. Wolf stands humbly and proud as a pioneer in the field of neuropathology. We are all honored, pleasured, and privileged for him to be here with us this afternoon. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I ask where you are to welcome Dr. John Wolf. Okay. Well, can you hear me? Yes, I'm hearing you well. And you, can you see me? Yes, I'm seeing you as well. Okay. And how about the presentation? It's maybe loading at the moment. Oh, are you doing it or am I? You will have to click share screen at the bottom. Yes, it's, it's loading. Okay. Okay, perfect. We're seeing it. Great. 
And are you seeing this box here too? No, I'm just seeing you and your present the presentation with the lovely picture. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Anne Marie, for that very kind introduction. Wow, it's great. And I'm very privileged to be talking to you today. I wish so much that I was there. Uh, this beautiful picture, I think, uh, um, I, I'm not sure where exactly it's from, but I think it's from near where you guys are currently. And that contrasts uh, quite starkly with um, where I am from, which is here. Can you see this slide? Yes, we are seeing a, an exceptionally amount of snow. <laughs> this is the street behind my house. It's not current. Um, it's taken a while ago, but uh, things are quite similar here uh, right now, and they're going to get a little bit worse over the next few days. So I wish I was there, but you have to embrace this, and we do. Uh, we do winter sports and things like that, so it's not that bad. So I was asked today to talk to you about a career in neuropathology. I don't know if I can do much better than the beautiful uh, uh, video that you had at the beginning of this uh, before the talk, but I'll give it my best shot and hopefully convince some of you to go into neuropathology even, who knows. So just as a kind of summary of what I'm going to be talking about today, um, I'll start with an overview of neuropathology and kind of try to give you a very superficial idea of what a neuropathologist does on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of the clinical work. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the pathway to neuropathology, kind of what hoops you have to jump through academically to get there. And finally, uh, why I think neuropathology is really the, what I call the playground of medicine. It really is, um, you know, I've, I've been doing neuropathology, clinical neuropathology now for 21, almost 25 years actually. And um, I can almost say that I've never worked a day in my life because I enjoy it so much. It's, it's really like, um, like playing every day, despite some of the sad stories that we, that we deal with every day. But we make the best of it. So what does a neuropathologist do? Um, I think this is what a lot of my colleagues think I do uh, from day to day. Um, so here's me in my office, uh, relaxing with a morning coffee. Um, but I'm going to try to give you a more realistic impression of what we do. So really, uh, neuropathology, clinical neuropathology is two jobs. We have uh, surgical neuropathology, where we um, deal with live patients, uh, tissue from live patients. And there is autopsy neuropathology. And that is kind of what the lay public, I think, um, associates pathologists in general with, and neuropathologists as well. But most of our work concerns uh, surgical neuropathology. So signing out, you know, doing tissue-based diagnoses, predominantly on tumors, but also on muscle biopsies, nerve biopsies, and brain biopsies for medical neurological conditions as well. We do research, so I'll touch on that. And of course, as I'm doing right now, um, we do teaching and uh, continuing medical education as well. So let's start with quick sections. So um, neuropathology, um, perhaps a little bit more than some of the other uh, pathology disciplines, um, we spend a lot of time in the operating room working with the surgeons to do um, what we call quick sections. And the purpose of a quick section is to be able to give the surgeon, the neurosurgeon in this case, an idea of, of what they're working on um, in the OR. And I'll show you why that it's important for them to know that. So here we have, um, are you guys seeing this okay? I'm, I have a bunch of stuff on my screen here that is in front of the slides, but can you see the slides okay? Yeah, we can. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, here you're seeing uh, MRIs side by side of two different patients. The patient on the left, this MRI shows that they have in their right frontal lobe and extending through this part of the brain called the corpus callosum. They have this big lesion here, and this is a tumor. The patient on the right is a patient the same age with a similar tumor. And again, extending across the corpus callosum, and you can see this big 
tumor, it has what we call mass effect, meaning it's pushing on the brain, causing the brain to move around inside the, inside the skull. So it's a bad, these are both bad tumors, but they're very different tumors. And although they look very alike by imaging, they're completely different tumors and they require completely different tre treatments. So the patient on the left has a tumor called a lymphoma and the patient, so, and the implications of that is that, you know, for lymphomas, we do not remove them with surgery. They are treated with chemotherapy instead. The patient on the right has a tumor called a glioblastoma. This is a tumor that arises from astrocyte cells in the brain. It's highly malignant, like lymphoma, but the treatment is very different. So these uh, tumors are treated by um, surgery. You can't remove glioblastomas completely, but you can debulk them. Um, so you can reduce the size and then they're treated with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So that being the case, if the, the surgeon does not want to remove a lymphoma, but they do want to remove a glioblastoma, and they don't know going in which one it is because the imaging doesn't tell us that. Looking at the tumor as they are operating on it doesn't tell them that either because both will look the same uh, grossly. So just looking at the tissue without a microscope, you, you're not able to tell. So this is a, an actual picture of uh, Dr. Sinclair here. He's a neurosurgeon here at our center, and he's operating on this patient with this brain tumor. So you can see here by, that just by looking at the tissue, there's no way you can tell what kind of tumor this is. But he needs to know. He needs to know if he needs to debulk this thing or take most of it out, or whether he can just leave it and treat it with chemotherapy later on once the patient recovers from surgery. So to do that, he's gonna give me a piece of tissue I give it to a technician. The technician freezes it quickly, stains it, and then I look at it under the microscope. And then I'm gonna tell the surgeon what it is, and based on what I tell him, he's either going to remove it with surgery or wait and address it with chemotherapy. Now, fortunately, under the microscope, these things look very different. So here, on the left, we see the patient with the lymphoma, and it shows this pattern. So these cells you're seeing here, this is a, for those of you, you know, who have not a lot of training in histology, this is our hematoxylin and eosin stain. So eosin stains uh, cytoplasm pink, and the hematoxylin stains the nuclei purple. And so here we have these atypical lymphoid cells surrounding these red things, which are blood vessels. And this is a pattern of lymphoma. And in this patient, if I were to look under the microscope at a piece of tissue from him, I'd see something very different. And so here we have a tumor, an astrocytic tumor. It has cells that are arranged in these palisading arrangements around areas of necrosis. And this is characteristic of a glioblastoma. So in this case, this is what I saw. So the diagnosis here that I tell the surgeon is, you know, this is a glioblastoma. And so he's gonna go on and remove as much as he can. There's no way to remove all of these things. They're diffusely infiltrated. He's gonna re remove as much as he can and, um, and then the patient will go on to have chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So um, increasingly as pathologists and as neuropathologists, um, there are other things that are kind of taking over our, our, our jobs which is fine because uh, we're part of this, uh, you know, we like to think that we're part of this, um, this progress in, in medicine and, and science and that we've contributed to it. So um, in the case of glioblastoma, for example, it's very nice that um, Dr. Sinclair can give his patients uh, something called 5-ALA, which is um, like a drug, but it's really a dye. And this dye is selectively taken up by malignant um, astrocytic cells. And so in the operating room, so the dye fluoresces bright red or bright pink under ultraviolet light. So in the operating room, he can turn off the lights, turn on his ultraviolet light, shine it on what he's operating on, and he can actually see wherever it's, you know, bright pink is, is tumor tissue. That helps him because when he stops seeing pink, he can stop uh, resecting tissue and it helps us because he can give us tissue that's bright pink so we have actual diagnostic tissue to look at under the microscope. 
So very cool. And there's been a, a lot of progress in, in, in many areas in, in neuropathology and in neurosurgery. So what happens then? You know, quick sections are not the best way to, to look at tissue. The tissue's frozen. There's lots of artifacts. And we, we tell the clinicians that, you know, we're, we're trying to help you in the operating room, but the diagnosis that I give you from a quick section is not a definitive diagnosis. That has to wait until we have permanent sections where the tissue can be properly processed, put on slides, and that allows us to look at it under the microscope and give them a final definitive diagnosis. And so that's the next step of surgical neuropathology, as it is for anatomical pathology. So we get the slides and we look at them under our microscope and we're either able to render a diagnosis right away with a report to the clinician. But in most cases these days, we require additional supplementary stains like immunohistochemical stains to show us proteins in the tissue. Uh, increasingly, we require molecular um, tests to render a definitive final diagnosis. And so a lot of the uh, final diagnoses have to wait for these extra tests before we can render a final diagnosis and tell them exactly um, what the tumor is, which will then uh, determine how the patient is going to be treated after their surgery. So the final diagnosis in this case was glioblastoma, um, which is not a good tumor to have. Uh, these tumors are invariably um, progressive. They grow even after they're removed, even after they're treated with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Um, to make that diagnosis these days, we require a molecular test as well. And that molecular test involves uh, analyzing a, if you all remember your Krebs cycle, isocitrate dehydrogenase is a Krebs cycle enzyme that's mutated in uh, some gliomas. It tends not to be mutated in glioblastoma, but we have to check because if it is, the glioblastomas do much better. So that's an example of one of the molecular tests that we do in all of our tumors now. And it tells not only how the patient's going to do regardless of treatment, but also how the patient's going to respond to treatment. So testing for IDH is one of the uh, growing number of molecular tests that we do to help the clinicians decide how to treat the patient. So the implications here are that the tumor is successfully debulked, um, you know, buying the patient time, and then the patient was referred for radiation and chemotherapy. We're gonna move on now. Um, so that kind of gives you a little bit of a window into, uh, into surgical neuropathology. Uh, so another part of what we do, and a part of my job that I enjoy actually very much, is uh, autopsy neuropathology. And we get, um, you know, so uh, our responsibility as neuropathologists is to analyze the uh, neurological part of the autopsy. And we get um, many interesting cases from Dr. Walker, for example. Um, and my particular interest in, in autopsy neuropathology is, is neurodegenerative disease, but I find all of the, the neurological case is interesting. So let's take a quick look at autopsy neuropathology and how we as pathologists and neuropathologists can help uh, clinicians and uh, perhaps more importantly families uh, who have patients with neurological disease. And I'm going to focus my uh, talk here on, on neurodegenerative disease. So here uh, we see MRIs, uh, just like the MRI we saw with the patient with the brain tumor, but in this case, we're looking at uh, two patients of the same age. Uh, they're both 70 year old men and the top row of images shows uh, various planes of section and MRI of this uh, cognitively normal male. And in the bottom, we see uh, MRIs from a patient who has uh, dementia. And you can see when you compare the brains at the the various levels at similar levels, the marked atrophy of the brain in the patient with this dementing condition. Now, neuropathology is crucial in this context because the only way currently uh, that you can make a definitive diagnosis of neurodegenerative disease, a specific neurodegenerative disease, is by postmortem examination. We're hoping that's going to change in the future. There's a lot of work being done on biomarkers. Um, things in the blood and the cerebrospinal fluid that can tell us the diagnosis, but we're not there yet. So currently, 
post-mortem examination, autopsy is the only way to make a definitive diagnosis of a particular type of dementia. And not all dementias are Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it's a common uh, lay fallacy actually that, that most or in some cases even all dementias are Alzheimer's disease, but there's lots of causes of dementia. Some of them, in fact the vast majority, have no kind of genetic implications for the family. So Alzheimer's disease in some cases does have very clear genetic uh, implications for a family, but in most cases are sporadic. Um, and in other words, we don't know what causes the disease. Same with uh, this very other very common dementing condition called dementia with Lewy bodies, and then we have vascular dementia, and there's, there's a bunch of others as well. And then you have um, causes of dementia that have a clear, a very clear uh, genetic uh, basis. And so making the diagnosis of these diseases has very important implications for the family of the deceased person. And um, so increasingly, we're getting requests from uh, families to, to do autopsies on patients with undiagnosed types of dementia. So examples of this include things like frontotemporal dementia. Some forms of Alzheimer's disease, as I mentioned, have a very firm monogenic or one gene basis. Diseases like Huntington's disease are also monogenic, meaning that one gene mutation causes the disease or mutation in one gene. So um, yeah, so th th this is a brain uh, that was taken from a patient um, with dementia. The brain does not look that atrophic. Um, but um, so the, our first job in, in analyzing uh, these things is to uh, do an external examination of the brain, in some cases, the spinal cord. And so we look at the brain from the outside. We look at the coverings of the brain to make sure there's no evidence of meningitis or other things affecting the coverings of the brain. We look at the blood vessels to make sure there's no aneurysms or vascular malformations. And we look at the surface of the cortex. We also look at the cerebellum here, the brain stem to make sure there's nothing obvious or glaring that we need to look into. Here's some of the tools of the trade. Not too much here. Now that's a knife. Look at that. It's a big, uh, this is what we call a brain cutting knife. We're going to use that to slice up the brain as you'll see in the next, uh, next slide. And so here is um, the brain. Our uh, convention is to cut the cerebral hemispheres in the coronal plane. And I've laid them out sequentially here in order. And we have the brain stem here and the cerebellum. And so we look at the cut surfaces of all of these to look for focal lesions and to look for changes uh, that might help us um, and direct our, our search for a particular diagnosis. So the next um, step is to choose sections. Uh, we have a, a routine number of areas that, that we look at for neurodegenerative disease. And then if we see any focal lesions, we include those as well. And those are embedded in plastic cassettes. Uh, they get uh, perfused and embedded with paraffin, which is wax, and then they get cut into thin slices. And the slices come to us. They're stained with our hematoxylin and eosin stain, stain again. And we get uh, sections from different brain areas on glass slides. And then we're able to look at these under the microscope, which is the next step. So let's recall our two, um, two patients. We have the patient on the bottom that has neurodegenerative disease. In this case, we get clues uh, from the imaging. So if you look at the purple arrow here, it's pointing to this area of the brain that looks very atrophic. And you can see it here in the coronal, what we call the coronal slice of the brain as well. So this is an area we're gonna wanna look at under the microscope. Another area of the brain that's very helpful when we're diagnosing neurodegenerative dis disease is this area here, and this is called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus, as you may know, is responsible for encoding memories. And memory is a big part of, of, uh, of dementia, loss of memory. So the hippocampus is always an area we want to look at as well. So in this particular patient, you're looking at uh, the hippocampus under the microscope. And so these, uh, these are the nuclei of 
uh, hippocampal cells. In this case, it's a part of the hippocampus called the dentate gyrus. And these brown blobs in the cells of the hippocampus are things we call inclusion bodies. And these are aggregates. They're abnormal aggregates of, of protein. We see them under the microscope. And we can stain using immunohistochemistry, which stains proteins brown. We can stain uh, these inclusion bodies for particular proteins. And there are certain proteins that aggregate in certain neurodegenerative disease. In fact, our whole classification of neurodegenerative disease is based on the identity of the protein that aggregates. So in this case, the protein uh, that we are labeling brown here is a protein called TDP43. So we have an antibody to TDP43 and the antibody has a brown tag on it. And so these blobs, abnormal blobs of protein are made of this protein called TDP43. And that tells us something very important. It tells us that this patient has a disease that's associated with aggregation of TDP43. And the diseases that do that are frontotemporal dementia and motor neuron disease or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So this patient with this atrophy here in this part of the brain and in the hippocampus has um, a disease called uh, frontotemporal dementia with TDP43 inclusions. And that's interesting because the most common cause of that uh, disease is sporadic. So most patients that have that disease um, do not have a genetic mutation that we know of and do not have a family history of the disease. It occurs spontaneously and we don't know the reasons why. However, there's a good proportion of patients that do have a family history and do have a genetic mutation. And one way we can um, address that in patients with this particular form of the disease is to look at the cerebellum. And so here you're seeing sections of the cerebellum. And in this patient, you can see in cerebellar cells, these little brown dots of TDP43. Actually, it's, it, this is ubiquitin, not TDP43. And so what this means, what this tells us is that this patient has a genetic form of the disease. It's very satisfying as a, as a uh, neuropathologist to be able to come up with a genetic diagnosis based purely on morphology, based purely on looking at the structure of, of tissues. And this is one example of that. So the fact that we saw these uh, inclusions in the cerebellum, along with the TDP43 pathology, allows us to make a specific diagnosis. So this is a disease called frontotemporal dementia, or FTLD, TDP, meaning with TDP inclusions, with a mutation in a gene called C9ORF72. And this is a um, gene of, of kind of unknown function. We're starting to figure out what the function of this gene is. But the important point is that it's mutated in this disease. And so we don't really care what its normal function is. It, by virtue of the fact that it has a mutation, it gains another function and causes neurodegeneration. So this has huge implications for the family of this patient. And so autosomal dominant transmission of this of this uh, gene is the rule, which, which means that siblings and offspring will have a 50% chance of getting the disease and that the family should be, um, should be uh, referred for genetic counseling and they can get tested. I mean, you can, you know, if, if they wish. Lots of people, lots of family members will opt not to, uh, but if they wish to get tested, um, they can find out if they have the mutation. Okay. So one of the funnest parts of the job is, is research. And so there is an expectation uh, on behalf of the department and the, um, and the hospital that uh, we engage in, in, in some research. And, you know, being a pathologist and being a neuropathologist, uh, the world is your oyster in terms of research because we are looking at human tissue and it's a rare opportunity and privilege uh, to be able to do that. Because, you know, basic science research, I, I work with basic scientists and collaborate with them. They're absolutely brilliant. They're fantastic to work with. But what they do, if it isn't, should be dictated by what happens in human brain and human um, and human tissues, at least in medicine. Obviously, you know, 
plant biology, it doesn't apply for plant biologists, etc. But um, but that should be the mindset of of, uh, of us working in, in medical science. And so my own research uh, concerns um, a protein called alpha synuclein. This is the, the protein. So we saw those aggregates of TDP43 and frontotemporal dementia. This is a protein that aggregates in, in Parkinson's disease. Um, and you know our, our ideas of, of what causes Parkinson's disease have, um, have been revolutionized over the last couple of decades. We now think of Parkinson's, you know, Parkinson's disease, we all know that it's caused by degeneration of, of the dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra. But we now know that it actually affects the whole brain, and not only the whole brain, but possibly the whole body. And the current thinking is, is that Parkinson's disease actually may begin in the mucosa of the gut and in the nasal mucosa, and then through a spreading mechanism um, ultimately reach, reach the brain over, over many decades. And that kind of goes with the fact that many patients with Parkinson's disease, uh, decades before they come down with the mu movement, the typical movement disorders, uh, actually have things like constipation and sleep disorders and, and things that are referable uh, to the systemic, um, systemic nervous system. And so it's been known for a while that uh, this protein called synuclein in, in all of us, uh, we all have this protein, it's just not hopefully in these abnormal aggregates. Um, and in patients with Parkinson's disease, not only does it aggregate in the brain, but it also aggregates in the gut, in the mucosa of the gut. And again, many decades before it even shows up in the brain, and one of the things that we showed is that one of the areas of the gut in normal people uh, that has a lot of alpha synuclein is the is the appendix. You know, the appendix you get removed when it becomes inflamed and you have appendicitis, you get your appendix removed. Well, it turns out the appendix has tons of this uh, alpha synuclein in the nerve terminals that innervate the appendix. And this is important because the appendix uh, is an inflammatory organ. It has lots of inflammatory cells and inflammation has been implicated in, in Parkinson's disease. So this was, it was very interesting to us and we published this. And um, it generated a lot of interest in, in the lay press and in the scientific uh, press as well. So people went on to, to, to look at whether um, removing the appendix uh, had any influence on your chance of getting uh, Parkinson's disease. And indeed many studies uh, showed that that, that that was the case and others did. So the the, um, the results were somewhat conflicting and controversial, but um, uh, studies are continuing to be done in, in this area. And one of my other passions is uh, this. Uh, so what you're looking at here is it's probably a little uh, confusing, but these big red things are, are neurons in the substantia nigra. So these are dopamine producing neurons in the substantia nigra. Their nuclei are blue here, and the green bars, striking green bars inside the nucleus, uh, we have absolutely no idea what they do. Uh, they stain using an antibody to a, a tubulin. Um, uh, we have no idea what they do, and our research is trying to figure out what they are, what they do, um, um, but it's it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's a mystery, and that's what I tell um, you know kids in in first year medicine. You, you you know find yourself a mystery, and and you won't work a day in your life. And uh, so this is the mystery I've been working on <laughs> for the last twenty years or so. Um, we have some interesting results, and we may get there soon, but not today. So the interesting thing is here on the left. This is a baby. This is a substantia nigra from an infant, a one year old infant. And here on the right is the substantia nigra from a 70 year old. So there's a developmental, clear developmental. And this is not just you know, one patient. We see this in all uh, one year olds and all 70 year olds, this pattern of tiny inclusions in old people and these large bars in, in young people. So it's interesting stuff. Okay, and I'm just gonna finish off with um, talking a little bit about, you know, how, how you become a neuropathologist. And um, it really, uh, the, the path to neuropathology it varies from country to country. So there are, 
international variations in, in neuropathology training, for sure. And neuropathology in Canada is a special case. And, you know, for those of you who are more, who um, are, are interested in, in learning more about this, I will direct you to this article here about the history of neuropathology in Canada and how the training program uh, came to be. But, you know, briefly, um, neuropathology in Canada really began in the field of neurosurgery. And some of you may know this fella here on the left, the famous neurosurgeon Wilder Penfield. Um, he was a brilliant guy. He was actually born in the States, but he spent most of his, his neurosurgery career in Canada at McGill University. Um, and I actually did my PhD there where he, you know, in the building that he worked and, you know, his, his fingerprints are all over that place. Um, it is really uh, Wilder Penfield's place. And he, he's the guy that, you know, kind of mapped out the brain and, and showed that different parts of the brain are responsible for different functions. And he was a neurosurgeon and his work was critically dependent on, on um, collaborating with uh, neuropathologists. So people who knew the brain and what it looked like under the microscope and the structure of the brain under the microscope and what went wrong with the brain, both grossly and under the microscope. So his work was, was critically contingent on that. And so this fellow here on the right is, is a guy he worked with very closely called uh, Jerzy Olszewski, uh, who is a, a neuropathologist that he recruited from Poland. Uh, and so they worked very closely side by side. And so that tradition of neurosurgeons and neuropathologists working side by side uh, began in McGill. It also began in Toronto. And so uh, the neuropathology training program in Canada today is, is kind of a, a remnant of that. It, it continues on today, that, that close working relationship between neurosurgeons and neuroscientists and, um, and, and neuropathologists. And so that's how it came about and it explains why in Canada, oops, this slide not uh, coming together very well, but in Canada and Great Britain, uh, so Great Britain has a similar system. The road to neuropathology after medical school, we go straight into a neuropathology residency. So the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, which is our, our specialty uh, organization, um, has neuropathology as a separate program. In other, um, other countries, um, the path to neuropathology looks more like this. So you, you go to medical school, and then you first complete your training uh, in anatomical pathology. So you complete uh, anatomical pathology residency. And then if you uh, are interested in uh, neuropathology training, um, you go on for fellowship training. So postgraduate training in, in neuropathology. And so there it's a subspecialty uh, of anatomical pathology, but in Canada, it's its own specialty. You know, that has its advantages and disadvantages. Um, I'm not very good at looking at liver or kidney, um, which makes me perhaps not marketable. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, there, there are advantages too. Um, I'm, you know, able to work with my neuroscience colleagues here. I think I'm better able to help my anatomical pathology colleagues with complex neuropathology cases. Um, but the two systems are different and they both have their advantages and disadvantages. But the difference between the two systems is very much a product of the history of, of, of the discipline in Canada and in Great Britain. So that's the USA and other schools of that other system. So my own road to neuropathology has been a very long and winding one, but a very picturesque and enjoyable one as well. So um, for me, after high school, I did my BSc in uh, biology and psychology at McMaster University. Um, I enjoy this very much. Um, I did a, um, for my honors thesis, I did a project on epilepsy and I just, I became fascinated with, with neuroanatomy. And so I, I, I did a master's in neuroanatomy and then I did a PhD in, in neuroscience and then, um, and then I, I sold out and went to medical school. And, um, and then after that, did a residency in neuropathology. So it's a, a long road, but I, I really enjoyed every minute of it. And, uh, and I, I continue to enjoy uh, neuropathology today. Like I said, um, it, is, it is a fantastic, 
fantastic discipline and I feel like I haven't worked a day in my life. And a lot of my colleagues will probably tell you that, yeah, you're right, you haven't. But um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks for listening and thank you so much again for inviting me. I really wish I could be there and hopefully someday I'll make it down there. Thanks. So thank you very much, Dr. Wolf, for that informative uh, presentation. Um, and at this point, as Dr. Wolf mentioned, we would, um, or perhaps he would entertain uh, any questions um, that you had based on his session. So if you wish to unmute your mic and ask a question, please, or simply type it in the chat. We have a question from Nalini. She's asking, have you ever taken tissues containing alpha-synuclein from a person during their younger years and then followed that person yearly until old age and take another tissue sample? Wow, what a good question. I would love to be able to do that. Um, so I, I've never personally done that. I, I think that would be an excellent research uh, research um, project. Um, there are studies looking at, you know, obviously it's very difficult to ask somebody to, to get a brain sample or even a sample of gut uh, when, they're, when they're perfectly young and healthy uh, with the intent of looking at, you know, whether they develop Parkinson's disease. Um, but there are lots of studies now looking at skin uh, biopsy as a way of um, diagnosing Parkinson's disease in living patients. Uh, this is a very exciting area. And so there are studies. Um, I, I have not done them. Uh, actually, I was involved in one. Um, so, but there are studies with control subjects who are young, who get skin biopsies. And then we look at, at synuclein in the nerve fibers that innervate the skin. And some of those in the young healthy patients do have synuclein aggregation. Uh, but whether those patients go on to develop Parkinson's disease, we don't know yet. It's kind of a tricky tightrope, right? Because, you know, what do you tell the subject? And this gets into research ethics, of course, but, you know, what do you tell the subject who did have some aggregation in their skin biopsy? You know, um, it just becomes a little bit, uh, a bit tough. But yeah, great question. And you know, there are studies looking at that, um, and most of them are related to skin biopsy. There's tonsillar biopsy stuff going on too, but uh, yeah, good question. So there's another question, um, Dr. Wolf. What specifically inspired you to choose neuropathology? So that's a good question too. Um, when I uh, went into medical school, I went there with the intention of doing, after my training in, in neuroscience and graduate work, uh, I was convinced that I wanted to do neurosurgery. And it's funny how um, like your friends or your family members or somebody you barely even know saying something can completely alter your life and, and turn it around. And so when I was in medical school and we were applying for residency positions and I had you know applied to all kinds of neurosurgery residency programs, I like neurosurgery very much, don't get me wrong. Um, but I was in the elevator and, and one of my classmates came in and he said, uh, boy, I, you know, I found the perfect program for you. And he had the residency program book and he opened it and he said, look at this, it's neuropathology. And I looked at it and I thought, yeah, that would be pretty cool. And then I talked to some people and did some interviews and I knew right away that that's what I wanted to do. Um, so it was a bit serendipitous um, um, that I haven't, you know, I wipe my brow every day that I made the right choice. Um, but that is, you know, the question was how specifically did I did I choose to do it? That's how how that that's very specific event in my life that kind of changed my course. You know, I, I would have been doing neurosurgery right now, which you know I may have been happy doing that as well. But um, but I'm glad I made this choice. Yes, of course, it certainly was the right decision. And finally, do you have um, any advice for students aspiring to pursue? a similar field or another subspecialty in pathology? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, um, go with what you, what you like. Um, don't go for things uh, because of prestige. 
um, go for really what what turns your crank. I you know I the the impression when I was in medical school, I had the impression that pathology was a bit looked down on because it wasn't a sexy uh, one of the you know sexier uh, specialties in, in medicine. And uh, I have to confess that you know I, I had a bit of that perception myself. Um, so and that that's wrong-headed thinking. In looking back, um, I, I think you really need to pursue what you're interested in. And like I said, you know, in the talk, it sounds corny as heck, but um, you know, find a mystery. If you can, if you can find a mystery in medicine, then you're you're set. It's something that you'll you know you'll you'll spend a lot of time thinking about and. And um, it really helps. I mean, it helps you maintain interest in your in your job. <laughs> I don't know if that was a very good answer, but that's all I got. That's a superb answer. So um, at this point, uh, before we close off, we're gonna make the final call to anyone who has any questions for Dr. Wolf. Please um, ask him right now. We're gonna give you 30 seconds. One last question for Dr. Wolf. Alfredo. So, Dr. Wolf, excellent talk as usual. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for saying so. Um, just for the benefit of the, uh, the students, given that the, your entry into neuropathology is unique internationally in that you went straight from um, medical school into a neuropathology residency, whereas elsewhere in other programs, you were first required to do a residency in anatomical pathology and then a fellowship in forensic pathology. In hindsight, if you had to do it all over again, would you go the same route or would you uh, seriously have considered doing anatomical pathology first, then a fellowship in, foren in um, neuropathology and why? So, yeah, just to be clear, you know, it's, it wasn't just my path. Everybody in Canada who does neuropathology comes straight from medical school and goes into neuropathology. So all of us Canadians are pretty dumb when it comes to anatomical pathology. Um, so, but for me, um, it, it's a difficult, it's a, a complex question, Alfredo, because it's context dependent, right? So in the position that I'm in now, I wouldn't have done it any differently because I love, um, the position I'm in, it's you know I, I think uh, I think I'm doing a good job here and uh, and I enjoy it very much. So from that context, um, I, I wouldn't have changed a thing for myself. Um, but in advising somebody else, uh, you may not end up in an ideal situation. You may not have the opportunity or the privilege uh, or the fortune, the luckiness that I, that I had to end up in this position. So. You know, in terms of marketability and in terms of being able to help out your colleagues, um, it, it may be better to, to do the anatomical pathology than neuropathology route. Um, the disadvantage of that is that you, you know, whatever position you end up in, you probably won't have the opportunity to practice exclusively neuropathology. Um, you know, especially in Canada where resources are are short and um, financial resources. So you're going to get your share of anatomical pathology work along with your neuropathology. Um, so I, I guess there are two sides to that answer, Alfredo. I'm sorry I couldn't be more clear. No problem, thank you. Once again, we're going to ask if there are any final questions. You know, it's not every day we get to speak to a neuropathologist. You can pose them now. Okay, so thank you again, Dr. Wolf, for that very uh, educational and insightful presentation. Um, we have received some uh, excellent feedback on your session. Um, via our Menti platform. As you can see, some students thought it was exceptional, informative, enlightening, thought-provoking, said you did amazing work, it was interesting, impressive, and inspiring. So as we draw to the end of this uh, event, it is with great pleasure that I now uh, present for this evening's vote of thanks, uh, Ms. Anne-Marie Minghorn once again.
Well, thank you very much. And thank you. I, I hope that that positive feedback means that you're going to invite me down there in person someday. Um, more than welcome. Uh, we'll be truly honored for you to join us. Um, we have beautiful beaches and our food is exceptional. I'm positive you will enjoy it immensely. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Anne-Marie, for helping me out here. No problem. It's now um, a great pleasure that I produce, sorry, present the vote of thanks for this evening's proceedings. John F. Kennedy once said, as we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. I would like to firstly extend our utmost gratitude to our guest speaker, Dr. John Wolfe, who, despite his busy schedule, graced us this afternoon with an amazing and enlightening presentation. We are extremely grateful to have been granted the opportunity to learn about neuropathology through your thorough and insightful presentation. We are honored that you agreed to volunteer your time for this initiative to share your passion with us. Your words, advice, and knowledge will truly leave an indelible mark on our minds, and we hope that the students in our virtual audience carry this knowledge with them in their future careers. We would also like to express our appreciation to our advisory board member, Dr. Alfredo Walker, and we thank him for his presence tonight and key role in supporting us throughout our journey. Additionally, I would like to say a special thank you to all of our specially invited guests present, present here this afternoon. It was an honor to have you join us, and we hope to see you in our future, future sessions. Last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you all for joining us this afternoon and making our event a success, and we look forward to your continued support. During these uncertain times, we extend wishes for health and safety to you and your family. And look out for the details of our next session on hematology and transfusion medicine with Dr. Kenneth Charles on 11th of March. Good afternoon and thank you.